When Peter moved into the house opposite, he was no celebrity. Indeed, it was at a time when people were too preoccupied to have much time for celebrities. The war was on. Our part of London had, until then, no bomb damage. Apart from ration books and barrage balloons, life seemed pretty much as usual. Peter lived on the better side of the road. Whereas the houses on our side were terraced, his was spaced out and had larger gardens. We had rows of houses at the back of us. He had the grounds of Alexandra Palace for an outlook. But there was no class distinction in our avenue. The fact was, the occupants of the houses did not go out of their way to mix much. Well, not until the German plane somehow got beneath the barrage and machine guns the length of our road. Then everybody talked a lot, to anybody. If they'd been within half a mile, it was as if they'd been on a route march near the Maginot Line. The milkman said it had just missed his float while he was talking to Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Jones next door said if you had not spent so much time talking with Mrs. Smith, the float would not have been anywhere near the spot. And the other, other folks would not have to wait for so long for their cuppers. The postman said it made him mix up his round, and he had to go back to the mouse, houses he had missed, which meant climbing the hill again, and his corns were so bad too. Mrs. Brown had let the bath water run over while she'd called next door to find out what had happened, and then it flooded, and she wondered if she could claim war damage for the resultant flooding. Mr. Baker became the proud possessor of a perforated water can. That stopped the cadger next door from borrowing it, he confided, with some satisfaction. The ARP was still in its formative stage. We had a warden for our road, but he had not received much instruction yet, as he told me the night of the first fire raid. He and I were the first into the road after the incendiaries had fallen, and set about a blazing summer house with his stirrup pump and bucket. Incendiaries were burning all over the place and I saw one in Peter's front garden. Supposed to use sand, aren't we? I asked. Oh, that's regulations, he replied, but where do you find any? I've got a small bath with some water in it, I volunteered. Shall I try that? No harm in trying, he replied. So I ran across the road to my home, staggered back with the somewhat unwielded bath up Peter's rockery, and threw the water on the burning incendiary. The effect was a little disconcerting. The incendiary burst into sections and started three more fires. Peter would no doubt store this in his memory of comic human activity. Regulations did say use sand, reflected the warden. I probably would have not got to know Peter but for a letter I received from a friend in the home counties asking me to befriend the somewhat sensitive lad who'd come to live in my area. Peter didn't say much to me when I called but his mother was extremely pleased that someone was taking an interest in him, a stranger to the district. Their lounge was at the front of the house and had a large mirror on one wall. Peter used to spend hours in front of it trying out facial expressions and acting character parts. He was a great mimic even in those early days. I used to watch him as he paced up and down impersonating some character who had captured his attention. In his isolation he observed the peculiarities. 
one Saturday, the ramble which I had planned with some of my youth club friends was cancelled because of heavy rain. So I brought the gang home to play a succession of indoor games, some of which were highly original. For instance, we went on an indoor ramble, which involved us in following each other round the house, downstairs through the cellar, out through the basement door, to climb the steps beside the dustbin, the lid of which was thumped in turn by each rambler, up the steps to the front door, which each entered in turn after demonstrating various energetic and original jigs for the benefit of neighbours who by this time had come to their windows. Peter obviously enjoyed it all from his window, for later I saw him in the mirror impersonating the rambling routine. No doubt the memory of this incident was retained. We were both away from London in term time. He at a large boarding school in Derbyshire and I in a Nottingham college. At his mother's request, I agreed to keep in touch with him, but our correspondence did not amount to much. I was a few years his senior. His mother was very concerned about him, explaining that they had moved house so often that he never had a chance to settle anywhere. His isolation and loneliness was perhaps typified by his living with the mirror for companionship. The circumstance developed his gift. One letter that I received from him was so sad that I arranged to visit him one day in the winter of 1941. From Nottingham it was a long cycle ride which took nearly three, three hours each way. The school had very large grounds and I rode, arrived soaked in perspiration. I thought how solemn and forbidding the great building was. I rang the bell and announced my errand. I had a long wait before he eventually emerged, a sad, slim figure. His face lit up when he saw me. Sorry, he said, the master made me finish what I was doing. We walked around the grounds to sit eventually on the stone wall surrounding a large ornamental pond. I shall be glad when the term ends and I can go home for Christmas, he said. I am miserable here. I did what I could to cheer him. At the end of twenty minutes or so, he announced that he must be back in the classroom or he would be in trouble. And so I had six hours cycling for twenty minutes' talk. As I cycled the long journey back in the murky winter afternoon, I felt very sad for Peter and wished I could have helped him more. I have wished that many times since, as over the years I've followed his brilliant career as actor and film star and many marriages, which did not surprise me, knowing his nomadic childhood. Peter Sellers, a friend, remembers.